Okay, this lecture covers Module 9 of the Cisco curriculum. Module 9 is called Address Resolution. And if we go and look at that, as always, we start with why you should take the module. And basically, the summary for Module 9 is to learn about ARP, ARP, which stands for Address Resolution Protocol, and topics related to ARP. Um, in particular, we'll talk about MAC addresses and IP addresses and the roles they play in communicating. Uh, we'll actually talk about the address resolution protocol and then uh, related to IV version, IP version 6, similar to ARP, we'll learn about something called neighbor discovery. So the first couple of sections um, in 9.1 talk about how you communicate based upon where the source and destination is. Uh, I really harp on this, which I've told you anytime I say that means you can probably expect questions about it on the exam. And basically summarizing these two sections before we talk about them in detail is I will ask you on the local area network what address is used for devices to communicate. Uh, so, or on the same network as this is entitled. And in that case, it is the MAC address that is used. Uh, the next section will talk about what if the destination is a, on a remote or different network than what you're on. And the answer to that is you use the IP address. Um, so, continuing on here in 911. We have the physical address, which is also called the MAC address, sometimes called a hardware address. This is the 48-bit number that is encoded into the NIC card that uniquely identifies the NIC. Uh, MAC address is a Layer 2 thing. Uh, we also have the Layer 3 address, which is an IP address um, that we use. So what they're showing you here in this first graphic is the fact that this PC wants to communicate with this PC and it is on the same network. So as we come down the OSI model encapsulating information, uh, we will have a packet that has a source and destination IP address in it. But when we go from layer 3 to layer 2, uh, we need the MAC addresses um, and that's what will actually be used uh, so PC1 is the source and PC2 is the, the MAC address. Um, another thing I harp on, of course, is how long are these addresses. Um, they're only showing half of the address or what would equate to half of the address. The address is actually 48 bits for the MAC address. And they're just making it a little shorter, easier to put here. Uh, the IP addresses are shown in decimal dotted notation. Of course, those are 32-bit numbers. And if I ask you about IP version 6, those are 128-bit uh, values. Um, again, if um, they say destination on remote network, um, I would also say destination that is not on the, the same network. Uh, basically, what they have here is PC1 and PC2 are now divided by, you know, a switch, a couple of routers, another switch. Uh, so why they do the, show you this is we go through and PC1 needs to send to a host that is not on the network. So it's most likely not going to have the entry in the routing table for PC2. So in that case, it's going to need to use the default gateway, which is the interface on the router on the edge of the network cloud. Um, so 192.168.10.1 is the default gateway. So that is going to be where we send our packet. Uh, or, well, I'm sorry, the, the destination is 1.1.10, which is this PC. So we have to send it first to the default gateway, which is on the same network. So the source is AAAAA, destination is all Bs. So that will get the packet on the local network over to the router. Uh, the router will then examine uh, the routing table and say, okay, 
I need to know where to get to to get to the 10.1.1.0 network. And it would say, well, you send it out this um, interface going to router 2. Um, so when it does that, it will go through and say the destination is all D's and the source is all C's. Um, the source IP and the destination IP remain the same. So what happens is we have to um, get the packet to its first hop. We then have to de-encapsulate it, which is strip off the uh, source and destination max. We then have to observe uh, the layer 3 information, the IP addresses, look at the routing table, determine where to send it, and then put new layer 2 headers on the packet. And likewise, when it goes to this router, this router will say you need to send out this interface. Um, so it will strip off these MAC headers, examine the IP information, and then rebuild an Ethernet frame by putting the source and MAC address back, back on it. And then finally, it will make it to the PC, which will strip off the Ethernet frame data, look at the destination IP, and say, hey, that's me. I need to process this packet, and it'll pack it, process it up the uh, protocol stack, the OSI protocol stack. Um, this packet tracer is related to um, looking at MAC and IP addresses. Um, so I will be assigning that, so watch for that to appear um, in Blackboard. 914 is a check your understanding once you feel you're comfortable with the material in section 9.1. Uh, you can take this on your own to, to make sure you understand it. And we'll move on to 9.2, uh, which is simply entitled ARP. Uh, the first section, 921, um, ARP operation, is basically telling you um, what the purpose of ARP is. So when a PC is sending information, um, in this case I'm pretty sure H1 is wanting to send to H4, it knows its IP address. But since it's on the same network, it really needs the MAC address to communicate. So basically what happens is it says, it's the ARP request is basically, I need to talk to whoever has the IP address 192.168.1.7 um, and that's not me so it's going to send a packet out um, to all the machines basically saying who has this IP address please tell me your MAC address so 1.6 and 1.8 will ignore that request because it's not related to them but 1.7 will respond back and say hey that's me here's my MAC address and then host one can use the MAC address to communicate with H4 again because it's on the same network. So R provides two major functions. One is to resolve an IP address to a MAC address and then it will actually maintain a table at least temporarily of the information it gets back uh, from these ARP requests. Um, so here we have an animation showing this. Um, again, H1 wants to talk to H4. So it will send out a packet asking for information. That packet will go to every host on the local network. And as we can see, 1.7 replies back and says, hey, that's me. Here's my MAC address. Once it has the MAC address, it can send the information um, to the, the destination. Uh, this is a fairly brief video, it's about 2 minutes 52 seconds, that talks about some of the information we just discussed and the animation we saw. In this video, we're going to see PCA send an ARP request for the MAC address of PCC. PCA has an IP packet with the source IP address of itself, 192.168.1.110, 
and the destination IP address of PCC at 192.168.1.50. So it needs to know what the destination MAC address will be. Because the source and destination IP addresses are on the same network, the destination MAC address will be that of the destination IP address of PCC at 192.168.1.50. So PCA checks its ARP cache for the IP address 192.168.1.50. Because it is not in its ARP cache, it will put the packet on hold and create an ARP request. The ARP request contains the target IPv4 address. This is the IPv4 address, which is known by PCA and the target MAC address, which is unknown. This is what PCA is wanting to find out. The ARP request is sent as a broadcast, so everybody on the network will need to examine this Ethernet frame and process the ARP request. So PCA sends it to the switch. Because it is a broadcast, the switch will flood it out all ports, except for the port that it came in on. PCB receives the broadcast, so it must process it, and its ARP, ARP process examines the ARP request. It compares its own IPv4 address against the target IPv4 address, and notice that's, that they are not the same, so it doesn't need to send an ARP reply. The router R1 also receives this ARP request. Its R process examines its own IPv4 address and compares that against the target IPv4 address and also realizes this is not its IPv4 address, so it does not need to send the ARP reply. By the way, routers will not forward ARP requests out other ports. PCC receives the ARP request, compares its IPv4 address against the target IPv4 address, and notices that it is the intended target of the ARP request, that the target IPv4 address does match its own IPv4 address. So PCC will need to send an ARP reply. Okay, of course that video showed uh, part of the process, which is the ARP request. Um, one thing important to um, reiterate is the fact of the destination MAC address. Since we don't know what MAC address we're sending to, they need to send a broadcast. And in the case of a Layer 2 broadcast, um, the way you designate that is by setting all the uh, bits in the MAC address to all ones. So they had a series of Fs, and of course that is the, the broadcast uh, MAC address. Um, the next one is a video. Uh, once the machine has gotten the packet, who has the IP that we were interested in, um, it's going to reply back. Um, it's going to put entries in the ARP table on the device that receives that information. So this video is a minute 45 seconds and I am going to play that here in the lecture video. In the previous video, we saw an ARP request from PCA looking for the MAC address of PCC. In this video, we will see the ARP reply in response to that ARP request. PCC, when it received the ARP request, examined the target IPv4 address and compared it against its own IPv4 address and noticed that it was the intended target. So PCC will generate an ARP reply in response to that ARP request. The ARP reply includes its own IPv4 address and its own MAC address. It is sent to PCA. ARP replies are sent as a unicast, so the destination MAC address is that of PCA. PCA receives the ARP reply in response to its previous ARP request takes the information, the sender IPv4 address and the sender MAC address, and adds that information to its ARP cache. 
PCA can now take the packet, the original packet destined for PCC, take that packet off hold and has the information it needs to send that packet to PCC. So it takes the information from the ARP cache, the MAC address, and adds that to the Ethernet header as the destination MAC address. PCA can now forward this packet in the proper Ethernet frame onto PCC. Okay, um, of course in that video we saw the population of the ARP table. Uh, the philosophy behind that is if you exchange a packet with a machine, it's highly likely that you're going to exchange more packets with that machine in the near future. So if it gets a hit on the ARP table, it can just go ahead and get the MAC address of the machine it wants to talk to and not have to do another ARP request. Uh, that ARP request and reply were shown for the local area network. Uh, this is going to talk about um, ARP role in remote communications. And of course, as, as I said before, this will relate to uh, being able to communicate with the default gateway. So this video is about three minutes in length. I will play it here in line with the lecture video. In this video, PCA has an IP packet source IP address itself at 192.168.1.110 and destination IP address 10.1.1.10 which is an IP address on a remote network. So the destination MAC address will be that of its default gateway 192.168.1.1 the router R1 in this case. PCA checks its ARP cache for that IP address 192.168.1.1 and there's no entry with a MAC address. So it puts the packet on hold and creates an ARP request. The ARP request has the IP address of the router 192.168.1.1 and the target MAC address is unknown. The destination MAC address of an ARP request is a broadcast. So it will be sent to the switch and the switch will flood it out all ports except for the incoming port. PCB receives the ARP request, compares its own IPv4 address against the target IPv4 address in the ARP request, and notices it is not a match, so it is not the intended target. PCC receives the ARP request, compares its IPv4 address against the target IPv4 address, and it is not the intended target either. Router R1 receives the ARP request, compares its IPv4 address against the target IPv4 address, and it is indeed a match. It is the target of the ARP request. So Router R1 will issue an ARP reply in response. It will include its own MAC address, 000D, along with its IPv4 address. The destination MAC address of the ARP reply is a unicast directed for PCA. So it is a destination MAC address of 000A, so PCA receives the ARP reply. PCA, when it receives the ARP reply in response for its ARP request, sees the target IPv4 address and the target MAC address and adds that to its ARP cache. It now has the information it needs to forward the packet which is on hold. So the destination MAC address is now going to be 000D, that of the router R1, its MAC address. And now PCA can forward the frame onto router R1. Okay, in the last couple of videos, we saw um, the process of populating the, the ARP cache, and I talked about why we care about that. Uh, 926 is talking about removing entries from the ARP cache. So typically, these will stay in the cache between 15 and 45 seconds from the last time they, they were used. 
And in computer time, when things are happening in milliseconds, this is like forever. Um, so when a entry in the ARP table has not been used in a while, um, it is simply um, deleted. Um, there are also commands that you can use to manually remove ARP entries or clear the entire ARP table. Uh, that's usually when something's really confused and not working correctly on your network and you just want to be safe and make sure that information is correct. Or if you know you have devices whose IP addresses have changed and you want to get rid of the possibly old bogus information. So to look at the ARP tables, um, all devices that communicate them keep them. So here from the prompt, we're on router one um, and you say show IP ARP. And what it will tell you is it will give you the IP address, the MAC address, tell you what interface it saw that MAC address on, and then it will have an age. Uh, so you can see how long that entry has been there. If you're on a Windows PC or a Unix slash Linux box, ARP space dash A is the way you get that information. And it will tell you the internet address, the physical address, and whether it was learned dynamically or whether it's static and um, is in the ARP table until you actually uh, delete it. Now then, ARP is required, obviously, to communicate both on the local network and the remote network, uh, but there's a couple of issues with ARP. First, it can create lots of broadcast. Um, that is traffic going to machines, if it's looking up lots of different addresses, or if each PC on the network is looking up a lot of addresses, that can be a lot of broadcast uh, that eat into your, your bandwidth and, and slow down uh, communications. Um, the other problem is um, security related. Um, if you have a hacker, uh, possibly, uh, or sometimes referred to as a bad actor, um, if you have somebody with malicious intent, they can see the ARP request and reply back and go, oh, that's me, and basically intercept uh, packets or at least divert packets from their intended destination, which will cause, uh, you know, the, the network not to function correctly. 929 is another packet tracer um, where you go in and just examine the ARP tables. Um, it's a, a pretty short packet tracer, but I do plan to assign it, so watch for that to appear in uh, Blackboard. And then 9210 is a check your understanding uh, to make sure you understand the ARP protocol. Once you've studied it, think you're ready to take it, um, you can come back in and take that. The next section, 9.3, is talking about IP version 6 um, discovery. Um, so I will play the, the video and then we'll come back and talk about it in the next um, section. Uh, this one is six minutes and six seconds long, so it is kind of long, uh, but I think it's important to play it here um, so it's part of the lecture. In this video, we will discuss the process of how IPv6 performs address resolution using ICMP v6 neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement messages. This is similar to the ARP process used by IPv4, but has certain advantages that we will see in a moment. Host A has a packet to send to host C. Host A has determined that the destination IPv6 address is on the same network as host A. Host A knows the destination IPv6 address, but needs the associated destination MAC address so it can encapsulate the IPv6 packet in an Ethernet frame to send directly to host C. Host A examines its neighbor cache to see if there is an entry for this destination IPv6 address. Similar to an ARP table, the neighbor cache maps IPv6 addresses to MAC addresses. For simplicity's sake, 
MAC addresses are shown here as four hex symbols instead of the usual 12. As we can see, there is no MAC entry associated with this IPv6 address. The IPv6 packet is placed on hold, and host A creates an ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation message. This is similar to an ARP request used for IPv4 address resolution. One significant difference is that ARP messages are sent directly over Ethernet. IPv4 is not involved. The IPv6 address resolution process uses ICMPv6, which is then encapsulated in an IPv6 header and then encapsulated in an Ethernet header and trailer. The ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation header includes the target IPv6 address, which is the same destination IPv6 address in the packet that is on hold. The target IPv6 address is mapped to a special IPv6 solicited node multicast address, which is then mapped to a special Ethernet multicast MAC address. This mapping process contains a significant portion of the target IPv6 address. This allows for the Ethernet NICs on each device that receives this frame to determine whether or not to accept and process the frame. This is where we see an advantage of ICMPv6 neighbor discovery over ARP for IPv4. Since ARP uses an Ethernet broadcast address, all devices on the local network must at least partially process an ARP request. The ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation message is forwarded by host A and received by the switch. The switch will flood the Ethernet multicast frame out all ports except the incoming port. Host B receives the Ethernet frame. Host B's Ethernet NIC examines the destination MAC address. The Ethernet NIC will accept frames whose destination MAC address matches the MAC address on the NIC, is a broadcast MAC address, or a multicast MAC address that maps to one of its IPv6 addresses. In this case, the multicast MAC address does not match any of these, so host B's NIC ignores the rest of the frame, without having to pass it up to an upper-level process to make this determination. Again, this is an advantage over ARP for IPv4. Router R1 receives the frame on its LAN interface. A similar process occurs on R1's interface. The Ethernet NIC ignores the frame because the destination multicast MAC address does not map to any of its IPv6 addresses. ICMPv6 neighbor solicitation messages are not forwarded by the router. This is because the solicited node multicast address in the IPv6 header is sent with link local scope, which tells the router not to forward these packets off the local link or network. Host C receives the Ethernet frame. This time, the Ethernet multicast MAC address matches a MAC address associated with host C, specifically the one mapped to host C's IPv6 solicited node multicast address. Therefore, host C accepts the frame and passes it up to its IPv6 process and then its ICMPv6 process. The target IPv6 address in the ICMPv6 header matches its own IPv6 global unicast address, so host C knows it is the target of this neighbor's solicitation message. Before replying, host C adds the IPv6 and MAC address of host A to its own neighbor cache, so it can return a neighbor advertisement message. Host C replies with an ICMPv6 neighbor advertisement message sent as an Ethernet unicast message directly to host A. The ICMPv6 header includes host C's IPv6 address, which host A already knew, and the associated MAC address that host A was requesting. Host A receives the Ethernet frame examines the IPv6 address and the MAC address in the ICMPv6 header and adds it to its neighbor cache. Host A can now take the IPv6 packet off hold. Host A updates the destination MAC address with the address associated with the destination IPv6 address and forwards the frame and IPv6 packet to host C. Note that if the destination IPv6 address was on a different network, 
This same process would occur to discover the MAC address of the default gateway, which would map to R1's IPv6 link local address on this LAN. Okay, when we talk about the different types of IP version 6 neighbor discovery messages, uh, we have neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisements, uh, which are used to um, get information about adjacencies or our neighbors. Uh, we can also do router solicitations and ask for information or discovery of routers that are in our network. And then we, we can have a uh, redirect message, uh, which is used for the best next top um, selection. Uh, down here at the bottom, it says that is beyond the scope of the class. Um, I believe that's now a Cisco 3 thing when you're talking about OSPF and EIGRP and um, other routing protocols. Um, so we can have device to device communications or we can have device to router messaging when we're doing the router uh, solicitation. Um, as far as um, ARP, it's kind of the same thing. Hey, who has this IP version 6 address? Send me your MAC address and it will get a neighbor advertisement that says, hey, um, that's me and um, my MAC address is blah. Uh, so works exactly like ARP does in IP version 4. Um, 934 is a packet tracer related to IP version 6 discovery. I do plan to assign that, so watch for that to appear in Blackboard in the near future. And that finishes up section 93. So here is a brief check your understanding related to neighbor discovery. So that finishes up the material for module 9. Uh, moving into the review, uh, what did I learn in this module? Um, I'll let you read through that on your own. It's not quite as long as it maybe normally is because this module was uh, relatively short compared to some of the others. And then 942 is your uh, module quiz related to uh, the entire module on address resolution. So that finishes up module 9. Um, so we'll continue on in the near future in Module 10.